Stop throwing bricks. Nice, Watch the lawnmower. Okay. All right. So, bat shalom, everyone. Bat shalom. So, let's begin. Screen sharing. Okay. Parashat shalom. Before we do that, let's do Shabbat uh, prayer and worship as we usually do. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. And uh, <clears throat> so we begin with a prayer, the blessing of the Torah. Baruch Atah Adonai, Baruch Atah Yahweh. Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kirishanu b'mitzvotav, v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Um, yeah, I, um, just a uh, I, uh, yeah, I've, I've given you permission, Jonathan, to record this, so um, you should be able to record. I don't, I don't know what's yeah, it's going. It's going. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Hold on a second. It's kind of um, got to turn the volume up here a little bit. Uh, what were you saying? Yeah, it's enabled and it's recording. Okay, excellent. Okay, so Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvotav. Blessed be you, the Lord uh, God, the King of the Universe. Who, who commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of your Torah. And we say, And let the words of, of you, Yahweh, our God, be sweet. Let the words of your Torah be sweet in our mouths. We continue with a proclamation from Isaiah. Uh, that sur kol kli yitzur alayich lo yitzlach v'chol lashon takum itach la mishpat tarshi zot nachalat avdei Adonai v'tzikatam miiti neum Adonai. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against me in judgment I do condemn, because this is my heritage as a servant of the Lord. And my righteousness is from you, say the Lord. All right, so now we have our declaration. And let's begin with some worship psalms. Psalm 48. Hallelujah, hallelujah, kom malachav. Hallelujah, kol tzavahav. Praise him, all you angels. Praise him, all you hosts. Hallelujah, shemeshver. Hallelujah, kom malachav. Hallelujah, kol tzavahav. Hallelujah, shemeshver. Hallelujah, kol tzavahav. Hallelujah, shemeshver. Hallelujah, Praise ye him, ye sun and the moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. Hallelujah. Let them praise his name. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded them, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. And he hath made a decree which shall not be transgressed. Hallelujah, Yahweh, min ha'aretz, tananim v'chol ta'amot. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye sea monsters, and all that is in the deep. Eshu barag, shelig v'kitor, ruach sa'ara, osad Fire and hail, snow and vapor, 
the stormy wind fulfilling his word. Heharim v'chol gevaot, the mountains and all the hills, the fruit trees and all the cedars. Hachaya v'chol behema, the mountains and all the hills. Eitz peri, the fruit trees, v'chol arazim and all the cedars. Hachaya, the beasts, v'chol behema, and all the cattle. Remesh v'tzipor kanaf, all the creeping things and all that has wings, the kings of the earth and all the peoples, the princes, the princes and all the judges of the earth, the young maiden, the old men and the children, let them praise, let them praise the name of Yahweh. For his name alone is to be exalted. His glory is above the heavens and the earth. And he hath lifted up a horn for his people, a praise for all his saints. Livnei Israel for the children of Israel, Am Karovo, the people that are in, that are near him. Hallelujah. Okay, so that was Psalm 148. We continue with Psalm 149. Hallelujah, Shir Adonai, Shir Chadash, Tilato Bikal Chasidim, sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the assembly of the saints. Hallelujah. Yismach Yisrael Be'osav, B'nai Tzion, Yagilu B'malkam, let Israel rejoice in his maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their, in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praise unto him with the timbrel on the heart. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Let the let the saints exult in his glory. You're running on Mishkabotam. Let they sing, let them sing for joy upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And let a two-edged sword be in their hands. La Bagayim to execute judgment upon the nations. And chastisements upon the peoples. To bind their kings with chains. And their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgments that is written. For he is the glory of all his saints. Hallelujah. So that's Psalm 149. We continue with Psalm 150, Psalm 150. Ashrei Yoshrei Veitecha Od Yalulu Chasela, Ashrei Am Shekach Alo, Ashrei Am Shadnai Lohav. Hallelujah Bekotcho, Hallelujah Berkei Alzo, praise God in His sanctuary, praise Him in the firmament of His power. Hallelujah Bigvor Otah, praise Him in His mighty acts. Hallelujah Korov Gudlo, praise Him according to His abundant greatness. Hallelujah, b'teka shofar, praise him with the blast of the horn. Praise him, hallelujah, b'nev v'chinor, praise him with the psaltery in the harp. Hallelujah, b'tofu macho, praise him with the timbrel in the dance. Hallelujah, b'minim v'ugav, and praise him with the string instruments and the pipe. Hallelujah, b'tzetzle shama, praise him with, hallelujah, b'tzetzle shama, praise him with the loud clanging cymbals. Hallelujah, b'tzetzle turap, Praise him with the clanging cymbals. Call Haneshama, let every living thing to hallelujah, hallelujah, let them praise and glorify the eternal God. Hallelujah. We continue with the great Ashrei. The Ashrei is Psalm 145. Ashrei Yoshrei Vetecha, Aud Yahalalucha Sela. Those who are have joy are those who dwell in his house. Tilala David, it's a psalm and a praise of David. I will extol thee, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee. And I'll praise thy name forever and ever. 
Gadol Adonai Mulamel, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. Belik Dulato in Cheker, and his greatness is uns has no limit. Dor le dor yishabach ma'isecha. One generation shall laud thy works to another. Ugvorotecha, and shall declare your mighty acts. Hadar kavod hodecha, the glorious splendor of thy majesty. Bedivrei niflotecha asicha, and thy wondrous works will I speak about. Ve'ezuz norotecha yomeru, and a man shall speak of the might of thy tremendous acts. Ugdula techa asaprena, I will tell of thy greatness. Zecharav tucha yabiu, they shall utter the fame of thy great goodness. Betzikatcha yiraninu, so sing of thy righteousness. Hanun brachum Yahweh, the Lord is gracious, and the God Yahweh is full of grace and compassion. Era chapayim ugdal chased, slow to anger and of great mercy. Tov Adonai lako, the Lord is good to all. Barachamav and his tender mercies, al kol ma'isav are over all his works. Yoducha Adonai kol ma'isecha, all thy works shall praise thee, O Lord. Bachasidecha yivarchucha, and thy saints shall bless thee. We continue on verse uh, 11 with the same psalm, Psalm 147. Kavod malchutcha yomeru, they will speak of the glory of thy kingdom. Ugura techa yidaberu, and talk of thy mighty acts. Lahodia livne hadam gavuro sav, to let, to make known to the son of man his mighty acts. Ukvod hadar malchuto, and the glory and the majesty of his kingdom. Malchutcha malchut kolol amim, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And thy dominion endureth from generation to generation. The Lord of all, of all who fall, and raises up all, all those who are bowed down. The eyes of all wait for thee, and thou givest them their due season. That open us thy hand, and uh, and thou give satisfies every living thing according to your favor. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and he is compassionate and gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all the call upon him. Nevertheless, they must be, those who call upon him must speak truth. He's close to all who only speak to him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those that fear him. He will also hear their cry and he will, he will save them. He will provide salvation. Shomer Adonai et the Lord preserves all that love him. But all the wicked he destroys. My mouth shall speak, speak the praise of the Lord. And let us and let all, all flesh bless his glorious name and holy name forever and ever. And we will praise the name of Yah. La olam va'ed, hallelujah, hallelujah. We will praise the glorious name of God forever and ever. Hallelujah, 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 Kerav Godelah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, mini behugav. Hallelujah, 
hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, Hallelujah, hallelujah. Call on Shama, tell Hallelujah, hallelujah. Call on Shama, tell Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everything that lives, let it praise the glory and the, the majesty of Yahweh, of God. Amen. Okay, so that um, concludes our little worship section. And now we will get into the Parsha. So uh, welcome for those of you who uh, just came in. And uh, Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And uh, we're going to do Parsha Shmini. So this is uh, the Parsha, as uh, some of you might not know. The uh, Jewish tradition has divided the Torah, which is the books of Genesis, um, Exodus, Leviticus, and um, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Those five books have been divided into the entire year. They're divided into 54 sections so that every week a portion of the Torah can be read and therefore everyone will be able to um, to connect to the Lord, because we are not to spend three days without Torah. We are not to spend three days without the word of the Lord. And where do we learn this from? We learn it from Moses. Moses speaks about this and uh, mentioned it in the past. So this concept of the parsha, the section of the week, this week is parsha Shemini, which means, Shemini means eight. And it is in Leviticus chapter nine, verse one, through chapter 11, verse 47. So let's look at this week's Parsha, which has some amazing things in it, including uh, where when uh, Aaron's two elder sons, Nadav and Avihu, the famous story where they offer a strange fire before God. Now it tells us, uh, Parsha's summary is the following. On the eighth day, following the seven days of their inauguration, Aaron and his sons begin to officiate as Kohanim, as the priests. And a fire issues forth from God to consume the offerings on the altar, and the divine presence comes to dwell in the sanctuary. Thank you. So Aaron's two elder sons, however, Nadav and Avihu, offer a strange fire before God, which he commanded them not, it says, and they die before God. Aaron is silent in the face of this, tra of this tragedy, of his tragedy. Moses and Aaron, Aaron subsequently disagree as to a point of law regarding the offerings, but Moses concedes to Aaron that Aaron is in the right. God commands that the kosher laws, identifying the animal species that are per permissible and forbidden for consumption, it's in this week's portion. So we just had that uh, conversation here at Passover here in Perry, uh, which Barbara is hosting so wonderfully, and we thank her. Um, so that came up as an issue, right? The issue of kosher. So those kosher laws are in Leviticus uh, chapter 9, 1 through 1147. So God commands the kosher laws, identifying which species are permissible and forbidden. So land animals have identi two identifiers. Number one is they can only be eaten if they have split hooves and also they chew their cud. Fish must have fins and scales. Any fish that only has one of these identifiers is not considered kosher. They must have both. Uh, and there are some fish that will have fins but not have scales. Um, and then there are a list of non-kosher birds is given and a list of kosher insects. 
which are, there are exactly four types of locusts that are allowed to be eaten out of the insect family. But in general, all insects are unkosher for consumption, except for these four types of locusts. And for the record, um, if anybody wants to eat them, uh, we got a problem because nobody really knows what those four species that are permitted. There are some, um, there are some Ethiopians and others who claim they know which kind of locusts uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish Ethiopians who, who believe that they have a tradition of which locusts are kosher, but it's not accepted by the general Jewish community. So that's a kind of a defunct uh, uh, reality. In any case, let's look at this week's Parsha. What we do, what we do is we read the Torah words in the original Hebrew, and then uh, we'll translate in the, uh, in the English. So because the Hebrew, original Hebrew has the power of God's word in it, of course. And it says the following: Israel. And it was on the eighth day that Moses summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. I'm reading from chapter nine in Leviticus, verse one. By Yomer el Aaron, and he said to Aaron, Kach lecha egel ben bakar lechatat, take for yourself a bull calf as a sin offering, va'ayilola, and a ram as a burnt offering, timima. That, that is unblemished, and bring them near before Yahweh. Not chap, uh, verse 3, El b'nei Yisrael, and to the children of Israel, to daber lemor, you shall speak, saying, Kuchu si'ir izim lechatas, take a he goat as a sin offering, ve'egel bekeves ben shana, and a calf and a lamb, both in their first year, that are unblemished as a burnt offering. Verse 4, an ox and a ram as a peace offering, to offer up before the Lord, and a meal offering that's mixed with oil, for today Yahweh is appearing to you. Verse 5, and they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of the meeting. And the entire community approached and they stood before Yahweh. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord which the Lord Adonai has commanded to, for you to do. Vayera Alechem Kavod Adonai, and the glory of the Lord will appear to you. Verse 7, Vayomer Moshe el Aaron, and Moses said to Aaron, Karav el Hamizbeach, approach the altar, Vaseyes Hachatat, and perform the sin offering, Vetolotecha, and your burnt offering, Vechaper Badcha, and atone for yourself, Uva Adaham, and for the people, and perform the people's sacrifice, and atone for them, as, as the Lord Yahweh has commanded. Verse 8, So Aaron approached to the altar, and he slaughtered the sin offering, the calf, which was uh, his, Verse 9, and Aaron's sons brought for, forward the blood to him. And he dipped his finger in the blood. And he placed that some on the horns of the altar. And he poured also the blood at the base of the altar. Verse 10, and the fat, and the kidneys. And a diaphragm with the liver. From the sin offering, he caused to go up in smoke. As the Lord had commanded Moses. Uh, verse 11. And the flesh he burned. Uh, and uh, the, the flesh and the hide he burned outside the camp in fire. Verse 12, and he slaughtered the burnt offering, and Aaron's sons presented the blood 
to him. And he dashed it on the altar around. And they presented the burnt offering. And they, uh, and they cut it into its prescribed pieces. With, along with the head. And they were a smoke that went up from the altar. And he washed the innards and the legs. They, these went up in smoke along with the burnt offering. Verse 15. And he brought forth the pe forward the people's sacrifice. And he took the sin offering, which was the goat. And he slaughtered it. And he made it a sin offering. Like the first one. Verse 16. And he brought forward the burnt offering by Aseo Kamishpat, and he prepared it according to the law. Verse 17. And he brought forward the meal offering, and he filled his palm with it and caused it to go up and smoke on the altar, in addition to the morning burnt offering. And he slaughtered the ox and the ram and the people's peace offering. And Aaron's sons presented the blood to him and he dashed it on the altar around. 19. And the fats from the ox. And they presented all these fats and the coverings and the kidney and the liver, and they placed the fats on top of the breasts, and he caused them to go up and smoke on the altar. And he waved the breasts and the right thigh as a wave offering to before Yahweh, as Moses had commanded. Verse 22, And Aaron lifted it up his hands uh, towards the people, and he blessed them. And there is a blessing. There is uh, only, we only have one prayer from God that God authored. And that prayer was the prayer, this prayer that's mentioned here of Aaron. It's, uh, um, <clears throat> That famous three thrice uh, prayer. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha, Ya'er Adonai pana v'lecha v'chuneka, Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem l'cha shalom. So that one prayer that Aaron was taught, he blessed the people with. Vayivarcheu ta'am, vayera, and the glory of the Lord, vayera kavod Yahweh, and the glory of Yahweh appeared, el kol ha'am, to all the pe people. So Parashat Shemini, we're going to explain a little bit what's going on here, but we won't really be able to get past the first line <laughs> um, simply because um, just the time factor here. So Parashat Shemini is the 26th weekly Torah portion. There are 54 portions. Each portion is, uh, there's 52 weeks in the year. And there are, there are two Shabbatot, two uh sabbaths where we read a double portion so this is the 26th weekly torah portion in the annual jewish cycle of torah reading the next uh and shemini eighth opens with the consecration of the mishkan the tabernacle well really the mishkan is not a tabernacle mishkan means literally the place that dwells or the place where it dwells referring of course to yahweh where yahweh dwells the parasha, uh, it's made up, parasha is made up of 4,670 Hebrew letters, 1,238 Hebrew words, 91, verse, 91 verses, and 157 lines in a Torah scroll, which is called a Sefer HaTorah. Now, review, let's get into the first verse. If we go and we read the first verse in Leviticus 9.1, and it says the following. In the Hebrew, it says, Vayhi Bayom Hashmini was on the eighth day that Moses called or summoned Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. 
what does that mean on the eighth day that it was it came to pass on the eight days by he always in the hebrew as i've told you many times uh in the hebrew uh, always uh, there is several meanings to the hebrew unlike the greek which is a technical language can be very precise hebrew can be precise but it also can vary in its several meanings uh possible meanings for the very same word so what does it mean it came to pass now the simple answer is it came to pass was that was there was an inauguration but is that the case this is the one of the uh, dilemmas that the uh the rabbis uh tackle so it says the following rabbi Yehuda, rabbi judah taught the words and it came to pass on the eighth day begins the second major topic of the book of leviticus the question begs itself if this is the second topic of the book of Le leviticus and um and it says that the mishkan the uh tent of god was cons consecrated this really should have been the first topic in the very beginning of the first book of, of this book of leviticus this book of Sefer, um, uh, Sefer Vayikra. So why is it, why is it that the second topic, uh, this, uh, the second major topic of the book of Leviticus is, um, is what really should be the first topic, right? So it's a question. So this is the question that seems to arise. It arises because if this was the eighth day, if you go back to the beginning of Leviticus, it tells us already what happened much further along. So uh, it should have appeared at the beginning, but it appears here where it does illustrate, this is an illustration that, that the Torah does not follow an absolute chronological order. In other words, there's this concept. In Hebrew, it's called Eim Mukdam Umuchar Torah. There is no first and there's no after when it comes to the torah the torah is above the torah the word of god is above time and the illustration of this concept that the word is above time is the fact that topics are not arranged in absolute chronological order so that's what rabbi Huda says that's what it means when it says Vayihi bayom hashmini, and it was on the eighth day. It's pointing out, yes, it's on the eighth day. It should have been much earlier, but it's not. It's over here much later. Why is it much later? It's to illustrate what Yehuda says to prove the point that the word of God surpasses and is above time. Time does not limit, and time does not constrain everlasting, eternal God. Here's, an, uh, here's another eight understandings of this very first word, Vayhi Bayom Shmini. And the reason I, I wanted to share this with you is to illustrate this point, this idea of how profound every single word is of, the, of God's word. And that profundity expresses itself in the multiple, multiple different uh, understandings that one can derive from even five, five words the begin of a sentence in the parsha. So here's uh, eight understandings. It came to pass on the eighth day. Now this is the Talmud, and we have to be careful. I, I've said this many times. The Talmud is not to be accepted um, uh, unilaterally. There are some good things in the Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud. Of course, there's also things that are not good. But when uh, we sh we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's my belief. You don't have to accept that. But uh, there's times when the, the, the Talmud can be quoted because it does uh, consolidate and uh, a number of Jewish teachings. So here, the Talmud says the following. That day, the eighth day, was special because it took 10 crowns. What were the 10 crowns? What were the 10 uh, powers of sovereignty that that day took? It's the first one it was the first day of creation according to jewish tradition yom hashmini the eighth day this day was an inauguration of the first day of creation 
And of course, that is something that <laughs> requires quite a bit of explanation, and I'm not going to go into it. But nevertheless, the crowning of this period of time corresponds to the beginning of time, which is creation. Uh, notice I said the beginning of time. That does not mean necessarily the beginning of, of what happened in past times eternal. But when we say the first day of creation, usually it's referring to the creation of heaven and earth, which, which is spoken about in Genesis 1. Number two, the second crown. It was the eighth day was the first for the offerings of the Nisim, the tribal heads. If you might have noticed, it says that Moses gathered the elders of Israel. Who were the elders of Israel? They were the tribal heads. How many tribes were there? It's a trick question. They're actually, well, they're actually 13. There's 12, right? But let's just say there are 12, right? So the gathering of the elders, the tribal heads, the offerings of, their, of them was necessary. Why? Because they, leadership needs to make atonement before the people. Notice even Moses had to make atonement. God says, even you, Moses, are not exempt from atonement. And therefore, if Moses was not exempt from atonement, neither were the tribal heads uh, of uh, either also not exempt from, from atonement. Um, number three, the third crown is the first for the priesthood. This was the first time that the priesthood actually offered a, sac a sacrifice to God. So this, was, this is what was special about the eighth day. Number four, it was the first public sacrifice. There might have been sacrifices that, uh, that, were, that were done uh, um, that were private, and we're not given privy to that. But apparently, it was also a day where public sacrifice was inaugurated. Number five, the first for the fall of fire from heaven. According to the understand, according to Jewish tradition, the first time God accepted this inauguration of the Mishkan, of the, of the place that he dwelt with, dwelt in, was the first time fire fell from heaven. And in order to establish the kingship and the sovereignty of God, and to um, uh, and this this was also establishing the uh, the first uh, the first authority on earth that was acceptable to the Creator, the first sacrifice that was acceptable to the Creator. And number six, the first for the eating of sacred food. Number seven, the first for the dwelling of the divine presence in Israel. The mystery of the divine presence in Israel is a uh, long um, discussion. But essentially, why this Mishkan, this tent of meeting, was established is not understood clearly. It's taken me many years to figure out that actually this was not God's idea. This was Israel's idea. Why was this Mishkan, this whole idea of a sanctuary where God would dwell, why was this Israel's idea? It was Israel's idea because they experienced at Mount Sinai that the goodness and the love and the incredible blessings from God and that experience fundamentally changed how they saw Yahweh. And that experience was such that they went to Moses and they said, we want God with us. And Moses said, well, that's going to be a tough one. <laughs> You've sinned over and over again, and you're constantly disobeying him. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to, you know, uh, get anywhere with the Lord about this because the Lord is a consuming fire. And if you sin, then death will break out into the camp. And this happened many times. And yet the Israelites insisted that they wanted God somewhere close enough that they would receive his blessings. And so the whole idea of Mishkan was actually an Israelite idea. It came from the people. It was ground up. It was not God's idea from the get-go. But God said, okay, if you want me around, you're going to need to start atoning because I can't be with you 
if you are sinning and be dwelling amongst you, you must immediately atone for your sins. To start making sense now, it's not that God wants continual sacrifices. It's the fundamental fact that the Israelites wanted God's blessing because everybody was healed. Everybody, nobody ever got sick. Nobody, everybody had plenty of abundance. Everybody felt happy. Everybody saw such goodness. They said immediately when God's presence left, they were desperate to get it back. And so they begged Moses, find a way to get God back amongst us. So God, so Moses went to God and said, we want you to dwell with us. And um, I can prove this from text. And I don't have time to go into this. But uh, in any case, God said, well, if you're going to have me dwell, then it's going to have to be a continual process of atonement. Because otherwise, I will not be able to dwell amongst you. And see, from here, we see the love and the humbleness and humility of God. Number eight, so the dwell, the divine presence dwelt there. Number eight, it was the first for the priestly, priestly blessings of Israel. And it's the first day in which it was forbidden to sacrifice to God anywhere but in the sanctuary. And number 10, and it's the first of the months. So the eighth day has these 10 crowns, if you will, that were established for Israel and for humanity, so to speak, through the agency of Israel. So that God's presence actually dwelt on earth as it never had before. And God's presence had never, ever dwelt on earth before this period of time. God had appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob temporarily. God had appeared temporarily to the Israelites when he gave Moses the Aseret uh, Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments, or really the Ten Sayings. But the first time that God actually dwelt on earth was with the establishment of this sanctuary. Can you see how important this is? Now, here's the second understanding. That day, according to the Talmud, again, we go back to the Talmud, we have to be very, discreet, the, you know, we have, you need to use discretion, but here's a beautiful concept. That day was as joyous to God as the day on which heaven and earth were created. So Yahweh, for Yahweh, and for Yeshua, that day was a glorious day. It was a joyous day. It's because he could come back. He can, God, Yahweh could fulfill what he, on some small level, what he always wanted, which was to have his family, his children, connect to him. And uh, this is why it says it came to pass. What came to pass? came to pass joy. That's what it means. It came to pass. Vayihi, that one word. So Vayihi is 10 crowns. Vayihi is joy. Number three, the number seven represents the cycle of creation. The number eight represents the circumference. That's that which lies beyond the perimeter of time and space. This is why the divine presence came to dwell in the Israelite camp on the eighth day and not on the seventh day. It's because it's the, uh, this concept of the idea that the circumference is where the divine presence dwells. It is beyond the perimeter of time and space. And according to uh, the Jewish tradition, Messiah has a lyre. A lyre is a kind of, I believe, a kind of flute. And that flute, or a kind of, um, excuse me, that's a kind of guitar. And that guitar, that lyre, has eight strings. Okay, so there's a lot to say about that, but I don't want to get sidetracked. Okay, so um, a, fourth, a fourth understanding going deeper. So we have the idea that there were 10 crowns, 10 firsts, 10 sovereignties on the, on the eighth day. There was a day there was joy that the divine presence rests with beyond that which is beyond time and space it was almost like imagine that as soon as the divine presence came 
there was a warp in the entire field of space and time almost like a like a you know they talk about these um you know holes in space right where time no longer functions right we know that in physics well here uh what we see is the divine presence causes that an eruption if you will of time and space uh, the fourth interpretation for seven days god persuaded moses at the burning bush to go on his mission to egypt right so how many days did god have a conversation with moses hey you're going to take the people out seven days and moses refused after seven days he said no i don't want to do it <laughs> imagine you're talking to the creator of the universe and he's trying to convince you to, to do something and you say no for seven days right and said god to moses finally by your life i shall tie this in your skirts when did he repay him for all the seven days of inauguration moses ministered in the office of high priest and he imagined it was his and on the seventh day, God said to him, I'm sorry, but it doesn't belong to you. It goes to your brother, Aaron. So God, in effect, said, you made me. You made you were stubborn with me for seven days. So um, and only on the eighth day did you accede. So here is your return for your willfulness to not listen. That's pretty intense. This is the Midrash Rabbah. So that's the fourth interpretation of Vayihi. And it came to pass. What came to pass? It came to pass the resolution to Moses' sin, if you will, when he refused to uh, listen to God to redeem the people. He made God wait seven days. And for that, he lost the priestly, uh, priestly um, office. And it was given to his brother, Aaron. Number five, a fifth interpretation of Vayihi, and it was on the eighth day. Rabbi Levi, or some other rabbis, taught that a tradition was handed down from the men of the great assembly. That wherever Torah uses the term, and it was, Vayihi, or it came to pass, that word, it's talking, it's the, it indicates the approach of trouble. Because Vayihi, Vayihi also has, uh, can be uh, translated in Hebrew, not only that it came to pass, but it can also mean woe or sorrow. So, for, so, so the first words in Leviticus here, it says Vayihi on the eighth day. This was a prelude, an anticipation of that Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, would die. That was the woe of the eighth day. The eighth day was an anticipation that Aaron's two great sons would die, as we'll see in a moment, what was a little deeper, what's, what was going on. We, can't, we don't really have time to go into why Nadav and Avihu died, but it's a very uh, interesting topic. In any case, number six, we're just looking at, and it came to pass on the eighth day, Rabbi Lazar said the following, it says in Exodus 29, 43, and there I will meet the, with the children of Israel and the, the, and the uh, sanctuary will be sanctified by my glory. God says uh, in Exodus, he, God agrees to this plan of the Israelites that he should dwell with them. And he agrees about this plan in Exodus 29, 43, much earlier than Leviticus. And there he says, I will meet the children of Israel and they shall be sanctified by my glory. The kavod Adonai, the glory of God sanctifies. This may, that, that, and this means that God will in the future meet the Israelites and they would be sanctified by him. And when did this happen? This happened on the eighth day. So when it says, and it came to pass, it's referring back to that verse in Exodus 29, chapter 29, verse 40, 43.
this is the eighth day where it's coming to pass now what God had already promised many, uh, uh, much time before that he would sanctify them by his presence. Leviticus 9.24, a little bit later, tells us what that experience was like. What was the experience like when God sanctified the people and they were um, and uh, sanctified by his glory? It says, when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces, right? which is very similar to what happened in the great temple of Solomon when... Uh, when it says the priests were so overwhelmed with the glory of God, they literally fell on their faces. They could not minister. They could not literally stand up because the glory of God was so powerful. The kavod in Hebrew also means heaviness. So there's a weight, there's a heaviness to the glory and the honor kavod of God, such that it is impossible to stand up physically. Literally, they fell on their faces. And this is exactly what happened in the tent. So this is what Rebbe Liaz is saying. It came to pass. What did come to pass? It came to pass that the sanctification of the tent and the sanctification of the people happened such that it, it became fulfilled that they literally fell on their faces and they shouted when they saw the kavod Adonai, the glory of God. Okay. Um, interpretation number... Nine, Vayihi. What does it mean on the eighth day? So Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman taught that Moses first incurred his fate to die in the wilderness for his conduct at the burning bush. This was a serious issue because God waited and tried for seven days to persuade Moses to go on his errand. As Exodus 4.10 says, And Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I am not a man of words. Neither yesterday, nor the day before, nor since you have spoken to your servants, servant, which the Midrash interpreted to indicate seven days of conversation. And in the end, Moses told God in Exodus 4.13, send, I pray, by the hand of him who you will send. Who is the one who, the, of the hand of him of who you will send? Yeshua, exactly. Now, as Moses understood that Yeshua would be the one who could, he, that Yahweh would send. So he was saying, I don't want to do it. Send your guy. Send, your, send Yeshua. Don't send me, right? What did God say? God replied that God would keep this in store for Moses, which means, uh, so one said that it was actually, a good thing that all the seven days of consecration of the priesthood in Leviticus 8, which you're reading now, Moses functioned as the high priest. And that was, in a sense, a reward, but it also came as a punishment because he could not continue past those seven days. And he came to think that the office belonged to him. But in the end, God told Moses, sorry, it's your brothers. And it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron. The other taught that all the first seven days of Adar of the 40th year, Moses beseech God to enter the promised land. But God told him in Deuteronomy, you shall not go over this Jordan. So for seven days, the seven day motif appears a number of times, including the time at the very end when God said, um, you will not go into the land that I have promised. So that's the Vayihi, and it came to pass. It came to pass that Moses' destiny came full circle, and it was over here, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman is teaching us, is that, the, his, that Moses was already fated by his actions all the way back at the time of the burning bush. Oh, wow. yeah, this is okay. okay, let me just... Hold on. Let me find this and I can mute it. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Now, uh, now comes the eighth interpretation of Vayihi. Are you ready for the eighth interpretation? And there are more, by the way. We're just scratching the surface. I want to speak about a couple of other things. 
so that we can um, we can soak up the word of God and uh, be glorified by it. It says in Leviticus 1, Vayihi, and it came to pass on the eighth day. So a Midrash recounts how Moses told Aaron, you shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting seven days. This was the Midrash interprets this to mean Midrash is the extra biblical literature that was collected by the rabbis and includes uh, ancient traditions, but it also includes some of their discussions. But the Midrash interprets this to mean that Moses told Aaron and his sons that they needed to observe the laws of mourning for seven days before those laws would affect them. Moses told them in Leviticus 8.35, they were to keep the charge of the Lord. What does that mean? What does the charge of the Lord what mean? But God had kept seven days of mourning before God brought the flood. In Genesis 7.10, it says, and it came to pass after the seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. So the Midrash deduces from this that God was mourning during this period of time. Because it notes in Genesis 6, 6, and repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him. The Hebrew word grieve is vayit yatsev, at his heart. And we find that in 2 Samuel 19, 3, we find that very same word expresses mourning where it says, the king grieves, ne'itzav, for his son. So just as uh, when it says that it came to pass on the eighth day, that what we find here is a instruction of for grieving, which um, Moses taught Aaron, which he derived from God, because God was the one who mourned for seven days when he destroyed the earth. And it says, uh, when it says it grieved him, this is referring to his mourning, that God was actually mourning for the creation that he had to destroy. And that morning is not less than seven days. And this is what Moses was teaching Aaron in anticipation of what happened to his sons, Nadav and Avihu, the elder sons of Aaron. Let's look at a little bit at the strange fire and death. We need to touch upon that because it wouldn't do justice to this parsha if we didn't look at that for a second, because it's a very strange thing. It, um, the story is, is Nadav and Avihu come before the Lord and they, they um, offer up what is called strange fire. What is this strange fire? And why were they killed immediately? It sounded like they were trying to do something good, but God pegged it as strange. Um, so um, it says the following, or Behuda taught the same fire that descended from heaven settled on the earth and did not again return to its form of from a place in heaven, but it entered the tabernacle. So what we have is a mystery. The mysterion and the secret of the Lord is when this fire came down for the sacrifice that the people were offering to God, this fire didn't go, did not leave the temple, the, excuse me, the, the sanctuary, the tent of meeting place. And therefore, it's that fire that came forth and devoured. That fire is the same fire that devoured all the offerings that Israel brought in the wilderness. Because the Leviticus 9.24 does not say, and there descended fire from the heaven. It says there came forth fire from before the Lord. What is this fire? This is the same, very same fire that consumed the sons of Aaron. As it says in Leviticus 10.2, and there came forth fire from before the Lord. And that same fire came forth and consumed the company of Korach later, as it says in Numbers 1635. And fire came forth from the Lord. Now you understand why God is a consuming fire. He is not to be trifled with. God, Yahweh, is not to be mocked and not to be toyed around with. And therefore, Picator of Elazar says the following. No person departs from this world until some of that fire which rested upon amongst humanity passes over that person. As it says in Numbers 11, 2, the mystery and the fire rested. So now we have an idea of what 
the strange fire was consumed by the fire of the Lord, that same fire that descended from heaven, but never left. And this is why fire against strange fire against the fire of the Lord is, um, is very dangerous. And Midrash notes that the death of Narabavihu is in numerous places. It teaches us that God grieved because he mentioned them more than once, the sons of Aaron, for they were dear to God. And thus, Leviticus 10.3 quotes God to say, through them who are near to me, I will be sanctified. It's a very great teaching. But in Hebrew, it doesn't translate as well. Uh, in the English, you get a, some sense of it. But it's, in the Hebrew, it's Bekarov Eli, Akadesh. Through those who are near to me, then that's how my sanctification takes place. In other words, part of the sanctification of God, of Yahweh, is because, not because Yahweh necessarily wants to demonstrate his glory and his kavod and his power, but it's a natural extension of who he is. In other words, no one can approach Yahweh unless they are pure without being consumed. And so this is what God is saying. Those who are near to me, I will be sanctified because they will manifest this fire. And sometimes if you're not appropriate or if you cannot handle the fire, you will be burned. Moses was able to handle the fire. As it says, when he came down from speaking to the Lord on Sinai, it says he had to wear a veil. Why did he have to wear a veil? It's because his face shone. Why did his face shine? Because of the fire. But Moses had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And he had also had an elevated level such that he could withstand the consuming fire of the Lord. But if one doesn't have the preparation of the spiritual altitude, if one doesn't have the purification and the holiness, if one does not have the proper spiritual vessel, so to speak, to withstand the consuming fire of the Lord, you'll be consumed. And this was the sin of Nadav and Avihu. The strange fire that they came to in front of the Lord, even though they were dear to God was they were striving to get higher and higher towards God. Well, what they did is they jumped the gun. They went too far, too fast, and they got consumed. This is why it grieved God. God saw that they were trying to reach him, but yet they did what? They offered strange fire. They had a fire that was unfit to be before God. Their fire was a fire of holiness, but it was not a fire that could withstand the fire. This was strange fire in reference to the fire of God, the power of God. So even though Nadav and Avihu in the Jewish tradition were extremely great men, as a matter of fact, according to the Jewish tradition, Nadav and Avihu were greater than Moses and Aaron in stature. But they, um, as we will see, their motives were not absolutely pure. And therefore, their motive of strange fire is what caused, consumed them. As it consumed, Korach who was also very great. Uh, this is why God said, the true them who are near to me, I will be sanctified. God is saying, there can be very great people who are have extremely elevated level of Kiddushah, elevated levels of holiness and purity and righteousness. But yet, if they drew, drew too fast, too near, without absolute purification, they are in danger of being consumed because God said, even those who are, who are extremely great, through them, I will, I will be sanctified. I will show how, how sanctity and how holy I really am. And this is what's going on here. So we have a, a, a teaching. Bar Kapara said in the name of Rabbi Yirmiya ben Alazar, 
that Nadav and Avihu died as reported in our chapter because of four things. So here's a, a deeper level. Number one, they died because they, were, they drew too near to the holy place. There is such a thing as distance. We talked this morning about space. There is such a thing as getting too close. There is, and that's one of the things that Nadav and Avihu, that was the strange fire. The strange fire that they brought was they got too close. And in other words, they did not know their place. Number two, they offered a sacrifice that had not been commanded to offer. There's a place to offer a sacrifice that God wants us to give. But there's also the danger of offering something that we haven't been commanded to offer. We all have that experience of knowing people who jump the gun, who want to be self-righteous or attempt to overreach themselves in their righteousness. And as a consequence, it stinks, right? We see it for what it is. It's out of place. It's inappropriate. It's not what it, it interferes with our spiritual path and our spiritual walk. It could be a pastor. It could be a friend. It could be someone. But if they're if they are not truly commanded, if they command themselves, so to speak, if they're not led by the Holy Spirit, then it's strange fire. And therefore, it's unholy. I mean, we've all had that experience from people like that. Number three, the third reason is strange fire they brought in from the kitchen. <laughs> they, in other words, they brought fire, not only that was not commanded, but fire that should never have been brought in. There was some kind of motivation in their fire, so to speak, or some element in that fire that was that was. Um, that was not uh, that was in contradiction to the holiness of God that they brought. Number four, <clears throat> it's that they they did not speak to each other. They did not take counsel from each other, as Leviticus ten one says. Each of them his censor. Why does it need to tell us that each of them brought their their own fire? It's because they both acted on their own initiative. They didn't talk to each other through uh, what they were actually doing. They got carried away with their own self-righteousness and own self-importance that they didn't even consult each other. They just thought, this is a great idea. Let's go do it. And so Rabbi Kapara is saying, these are the four reasons why Nadav and Avihu, even though they were attempting to serve God, the fire, the holy sanctified fire of God came and consumed them Rabbi Mani of Shahav in Galilee and Rabbi Yochanan said, Nadav and Avdihu died in four things. Number one is, so here we have another uh, picture and lenses, lens, another set of lenses to know why, why Nadav and Avihu passed away. Number one is because they drank wine. Drink not wine. No wine nor strong drink when you are in the, in the sanctuary. The problem wasn't that they drank wine. The problem is, is that there are certain places where you don't drink wine. And when you're meeting with God, you don't drink wine. God had said, don't drink it. And they disobeyed. And that's why they passed away. Another, so even though they were doing, could have been doing a righteous thing, it's because they, had violated one of the commands. Number two, because they lacked the prescribed number of garments while officiating. That's another answer. It says, uh, and it says, not you lacked robes. They were carried out in tunics. And so God had already commanded them not to do this. And they thought they were above the law. Number three, because they entered sanctuary without washing their hands and feet. Um, and he's, and he says a fourth reason is because they had no children. <clears throat> so there is something about holiness that requires having children. And since they didn't have them, that was the reason why they passed away. There's a fifth reason. Reverend Levy said they died because they were arrogant. And this is very interesting. It says many women remained unmarried and they were waiting for them. 
But Nadav and Avihu were very great men, and they were too proud. And they thought, well, our father, our father, their father's brother Moses was king. Their mother's brother was a prince. Their father Aaron was a high priest. And they were deputy high priest. There's no woman that was worthy of them. <laughs> they were basically saying, there's no one for us to marry who's uh, good enough for us because you know, we're, we got all the leadership positions. So, not, so Rabbi Nachama taught in the name of Yeshua, Did he freeze? His uh, his computer must have dropped out with no power. Hang tight, you guys. He'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Either he, for, um, yeah, he froze, or there's a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob, your volume is, uh, I think you press your mute button. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, you're muted. Now, okay. there, there you go. <clears throat> Thank you. So, so it says that fire devour, devoured their young men because their virgins had no marriage song. So, so Psalm 78, 63 is what is the verse that applies to them. <laughs> Which the, the, there were young men, they devoured them because their virgins had no marriage song. So King David ascribes the fact that Nadav and Avihu is because of their arrogance towards women was what doomed them. That was a strange fire that they brought before God. Their pride and their arrogance doomed them, even though they might have been uh, doing the right thing, it was their motivation and their attitude which doomed them. According to the Sifra, which is another Midrashic literature, some say that Nadav and Avihu died because earlier, when at Sinai, they were walking behind Moses and Aaron, and they said to each other, in a little while, the two old men are going to die, and we'll lead the congregation. <laughs> and then God said, we will see who will bury whom. In other words, the, uh, they probably were frustrated with the longevity of Moses and Aaron, who seemed to be, <laughs> not only were they uh, extremely healthy and vital, um, they uh, lived um, for a long time. And since they coveted the leadership positions. So God said, uh, and God overheard their comment, the, op the when it came time and they attempted to establish what's really the Midrash is saying, what they were attempting to establish their authority by offering this strange fire and to God, it was strange. That was God said, I didn't, you know, yes, you're great. Yes, you're attempting to advance. Nevertheless, um, if you're gonna do it with arrogance, that is not going to cut it. That is not going to work. So that's a little bit on this week's Parsha. And uh, we have a little time. So uh, any, any questions or any, um, uh, any questions in regards to the Parsha before we move on? And I'd like to um, speak about... Uh, hmm. Either six ways Satan tries to destroy the divine law or the six key definitions of the good news. I have done, I know some of you have heard the six key definitions of the good news. I really haven't uh, really spoken about the six ways Satan tries to destroy God's law. Maybe we can do that. Unless anybody has any questions. Yes. Uh, yes. I'll go ahead, Isn't Jacob. The strange fire it is the fire of their own. Efforts. Okay, yeah, so the, the Midrash is implying that, yes, the question is, isn't the strange fire 
their own self-motivation. And um, yes, that's part of the, uh, that is definitely part of the equation here that's going on. It's a self, the self-will, the self-righteousness, the self-attempt uh, to, um, to move forward without uh, God is, yes, is fatal. If you observe all the religions, you can find a trace or, or residue self to, to seek for holiness within yourself, mm -hmm. to, to, to derive or to get the holiness from your own efforts. Yes, that's right. Okay, so let's uh, let's begin. We're gonna. Um, I'm just gonna cover a couple of main points here, because this came up during our Passover um, uh, meeting about the law. And there are many falsely translated and interpreted scriptures that teach that the divine law was done away or nailed to the cross. In 1 John, we read, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. And the law referred as the Ten Commandments. Uh, but 1 John reminds us that those who truly love God will keep his commandments which are not grievous. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. But the devil spends a lot of energy and time getting people to believe the law is done away with. And this is why um, he was prophesied in Daniel 7.25, he shall think to change the times and the laws. For changing any and all creators' times and laws is a satanic trademark. Uh, we can easily show that there's not one divine time or law that has not been tampered, changed, abrogated, or done away with. Why is, the why is the canceling of divinely appointed times and laws so important to the deceiver? Because scripture says very clearly in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so if he can, uh, he's desperate to prove to Yahweh in, in one of his lawsuits that it's impossible for us, his children, to truly love God. And if, and the way he demonstrates that we truly don't love God, the perfect way is the proof, so to speak, that he can go up to heaven and show and wave in front of God is the fact that we violate his commandments. That shows where, our tr where the true um, motivation lies within each person. And so... And he, the Lord, it says in Deuteronomy 4.13, he declared unto you his covenant, which commanded you to perform even 10 commandments, and he wrote upon them the ten, two tablets of stone. Our creator likewise says in 1 John, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. But this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Did you notice? His commandments are not grievous. Grievous. David says, Psalm 119, 97, how, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, 113 says, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Psalm, uh, verse 165 says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The words not grievous Promises the commandments are not difficult or painful to keep in and through Christ, to Yeshua's strength, Christ's strength, just the opposite. So, um, how does how does the key question is what are the six ways that Satan tries to to destroy the divine law? So the first way is he claims that the entire Old Testament and its divine laws have been done away with. Oh yeah, keep keep the Keep the new. Just, just forget about the old. <laughs> Sound familiar? How convenient for sin. All you need to now do now is just believe in our Savior, died for your sins, publicly confess it, and then just do what you want, and you're good, because none of that law applies. That's the first way. This is a satanic lie, and they use a few New Testament scriptures falsely translated to prove this. The second way Satan tries to destroy the divine law his next option 
is to get people to believe at least the chukim and mishpatim and testimonies of the first testament laws have been done away with. Okay, he'll say, okay, the Ten Commandments still stand, but everything else is gone. <laughs> so the various uh, kinds of sexual crimes and countless other religious and civil crimes are left unmentioned and unpunished. And so that's how we, I promulgated them, says God. You do not have permission to second guess the legitimacy. God says very clearly, you don't, you cannot second guess me. And he says this in, in Leviticus 18, 4, 5. My ordinances shall you do. My statutes shall you keep. I am the Lord your God. I am Jehovah. I am the Lord. I promulgated them. You do not have permission to mess with them. That's the second way. So that Satan tries to get people to believe that it's all, that it's all done away with except for uh, the Ten Commandments, but yet God says very clearly, you can't second guess my commandments. The third way, the devil can't get Christians to reject the Old Testament or to reject the statutes and judgment. He'll simply say, the Ten Commandments have really just That's been done do. the cross. Off. I need that off. What is it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, the uh, so, that's how he gets people to, uh, to um, that deception is the third way to destroy divine laws, to claim that they're nailed to this temple is the most holy uh, and the most holy place is the 10 are represented in, in, in our, in our sacred body temple. And so those who say that, that, that the 10 laws are done away with, it's like saying that there is a, uh, our bodies do not have sacredness within them. The statutes and the judgments are uh, represented by the golden helix DNA, DNA, RNA. There are 10 rungs are in this ladder in this golden helix, which completes a 360 degree spiral. So this, this beautiful gold ladder has 10 rungs on it and that represents the 10 commandments. People are exposing their ignorance when they say, that the Ten Commandments are were nailed away or done away with. The fourth way he tries to do it, he says, well, the good news is you just believe in this gospel and you're saved in sin, not from sin. This is another way. And the fifth way he destroy, destroys the divine law, he claims that God laws must be kept except the fourth commandment. Because God was Christ, Christ was resurrected on the first day of the week. That's a, a fifth way. The sixth way Satan tries to destroy the vine law, his desperate attempt is to say, um, is to uh, is to tell people uh, that the fourth commandments, the fourth commandment um, is based on. Uh, is based on superficial flimsy reasoning, right? The sixth way he tries to destroy it is, uh, is he tries to select different commandments that people would like to eliminate from themselves to say that they don't apply. In any case, so that's about six ways. Um, I don't wanna go into all details here because it's the holiday, it's Passover. And um, I hope you've uh, enjoyed our little Torah session. And uh, we're open for questions or any uh, comments. And um, yeah, okay. So, hi, Jonathan. Yeah. That was a good teaching, brother. Very Thank good. You. Thank you. Good to see you. Okay. So, uh, I guess we can summarize. We had uh, we went through the parsha. We had eight understandings, and we also touched on Nadav and Avihu, their death, and we got some understanding there. But we saw that even one verse of, or even one word of Vayihi can have several more meanings, and uh, therefore, the word is the glory, and we are always to turn to the word because the word is uh, really the truth. And the truth will set you free, as Yeshua said. All right. Well, um, 
Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and Chag Sameach. I want to wish everyone a happy Passover. Thank you for joining. And uh, I have a comment. Further ado, Martin, would you like to a uh, question or a prayer? Or? Well, I, I had a comment, if I may. Yes, surely. Uh, just, just uh, amplifying on what you were saying um, mm -hmm. on uh, the ways that the devil undermines the law of God. Mm -hmm. um, it is interesting to see. Oh, let me let me turn on the camera so I'll make it more personal. Let me see. There we go. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. Got a haircut. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that in the First Testament. The, the devil was pushing for perfection and uh, to the point of legalism, where everything was about the law and no love, no grace. And that was one extreme, which obviously is not good. And now with the New Testament, and then after Christ came, everything became about grace, so much so that it became cheap. And the law, oh, we don't need that then. And uh, one without the other one, you know, there has to be a balance. Uh, somebody said once, well, and I quote that grace and, and, and the law, the justice must kiss where they're in a perfect balance with each other. And that, that keeps us in the narrow path. Mm -hmm. Going too heavy on one or the other, which was the message that Christ brought and, and the beef he had with the doctors of the law at the time. And you, you, you made it and you've turned it into a burden when it's not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be freedom. And, and you, you've, you've taken it. Not only that, you do what I say or rules for thee and not for me. And there, so um, it's interesting how, yeah, that was very smart. Either he oversells you or he undersells you. As long as you're not doing it the way that Yahweh requires, right? Uh, and and in a way, yeah, the the two sons of Aaron they over they overdid it. They oversold themselves and stepped out of the path, and they paid the ultimate price. We cannot presume. Presumption is a mother of uh, <laughs> of um, mess ups. It's better to err on the side of caution and stay within the confines of what the Lord requires in his law than to presume otherwise because then the cost is too high. And unfortunately, people are, uh, yeah, they're presuming all over the place out of their own lawlessness, mm -hmm. which, by the way, when, you, when Yeshua says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, the word iniquity, when translated, means you lawless ones. Mm -hmm. There can be no order without law. And, uh, and, and this new form of uh, spirituality, cheap grace, where God is all love and don't worry about the justice of God is, is the other extreme. Right. Yeah. And, yes. and, and, and compounded with horrible translations and, and ravenous wolves in sheep's clothing. And we got a bit of a mess going on these days. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. So uh, I think we should close with a prayer and uh, let's close with a, with a tefillah, with a prayer. Let's um, have code searcher. You want to ask Jonathan to pray? Okay. Yeah, I'll All close right. this out. Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah, sure. I'll follow you who are we? We come to your throne of mercy, Father, just uh, praising you and thanking you for this day and for this feast time. Father, um, we, we just are amazed at uh, the revelation and the lessons that we've learned from these things that you established for us, Father, and we just give you the praise for that. Abba, I ask that you uh, go with each one of these um, after this and bless them and keep them safe. Father, um, bring them back uh, to, to Shabbat again. Let them continue to learn with us and um, uh, grow in your name and in your calendar, Father. And uh, yeah, let's see this um, magnified, Father, this truth be all over the world. Uh, Abba, we just, uh, we just love you. And we thank you for this, this festival time and the lessons that we learned here and all the fellowship and um, just keep everyone safe. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. We got the thank you, Jonathan, from everybody here at uh, in Perry. And that's from uh, Barbara and Enoch and Yako and Christine and, and uh, Brian and Lindsay and uh, I don't know the uh, nephews, Yako's still... Yako's nephews and and um, did I miss anybody? Um, you guys still got a crowd there. That's good. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, it's so quiet. I would have never guessed there was a whole town behind you. <laughs> well, you know, it's been it's been an intense uh, seven days of uh, constant learning and stuff. So people are kind of winding down a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You can see everyone. Yeah, there you go. So, Amen. So yeah. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for the prayers, Jonathan. And uh, uh, we we wish everyone a chag sameach, a happy a happy Passover, and happy Yom Tov, a happy day, a day of celebrations. And may, as Jonathan said, let it carry us and protect us as we walk in the days of head and we get magnification. Amen. We ask in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Okay, chag sameach, and uh, maybe I can find a. Uh, some kind of uh, Jewish song to finish us up off. And uh, 